Uh, if you ever want me to sing "Get Along, Little Doggy" at your funeral, my oh, is that uh, that's one song? Is that <laughs> the other playlist is gonna be all right. I don't know. I suppose there's a song out there. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I know a lot of Depeche Mode songs. <laughs> I'll do a Devo song. There we go. Crack that whip. Yeah. If you die, I'll, uh, all I'll right. crack that whip. In all your right, funeral, sounds good. Hey, Internet. It's Paul. It's Matt, the Dork Lords. We are here talking about Watchmen, Season 1, Episode 3. She was killed by space junk. Uh, that title uh, is reference to a Devo song, which, uh, as you know, uh, if you watch the episode, uh, Lori Blake is listening to Devo. Doesn't listen to that song, per se, but uh, that is also reference. Plus... I think it then references the close call that she has at the end of the episode yes. when a car falls from space yep. and almost uh, hits her. Yes. Um, so, yes. Uh, but it could also uh, refer to uh, Mr. Manhattan's space junk. Uh, <laughs> it's true. That's true. He had space junk. She had a, a duplicate of yes. said space yep, junk. She did. She carries it in a briefcase. Yep. Well, it could also reference the brick that she tells in her joke. Yes, in exactly, skin. see? Um, yes, and then it kills God. It kills God. Puts his brains out through his nose. Yep. Or her nose. If it's she was killed by Jason. I don't know. I think she says he, but... I think, it's, I think she says he. <laughs> um, all right, so, yes, this episode is primarily a, an introduction to Lori Blake. Yep. She is the second Silk Spectre. Yep. She had a relationship with Dr. Manhattan. Uh, she then had a relationship with Night Owl. We learn from this episode that Night Owl is currently in prison. And in fact, uh, Senator, I think it's a senator, Senator Keene, yeah. who's running for president, yeah. uh, is using that uh, to uh, get Lori to work for him. Like, hey, look, I can let Night Owl out of prison with pardons if I'm president. Uh, so help me. Uh, and so he encourages her. Uh, strongly to go to Tulsa to help uh, check into this murder of Don Johnson. <laughs> um, Lori Blake is an FBI agent now. She is no longer a costumed vigilante, um, as we know her. Her love, in well, her two love interests. One is on Mars. One's in jail. Um, she has a pet owl. I assume has a, some connection to Night Owl there. Uh, who, who, the Nile's name is Who? Yes. There's a little like who's on first joke there. Yeah. But, uh, but I think there's two things there. One is obviously owls go who, but also who watches the Watchmen? Oh. Uh, perhaps. Mm. Uh, mm. Who so there, the that's the answer. Watching there you go. The that, who, oh, that, that's the answer. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> who's watching the Watchmen? Oh, yeah, there he is. There he is. Watching yeah. him. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Manhattan with who? <laughs> Doctor Who. There, now you've there you totally go. jumped you go. into another universe. There you go. She, we see her first in action, staging a fake bank robbery to uh, trap a masked hero. Yes. This particular hero is the Shadow. Uh, I would say a, a very strong stand-in for Batman. Sure. Uh, he has a lot of Batman-esque qualities he to him. He does. Him. Funny voice. Uh, the little weapons that aren't lethal. Right. Um, I think, yeah. Anyway, so the shadow drops into the bank uh, and is like throwing a bolo at, at what turns out to be an FBI agent. Um, and it's, the rug's pulled out from under him, essentially. Like, ah, boy, you were tipped off. I wonder how you found out this information. Maybe it was the FBI. <laughs> uh, he's like, oh, crap. Tries to run away. She shoots him in the back. At some right after that, one of the uh, one of her seconds in command is like, "Oh, how'd you know he had such good armor?" And this, she doesn't reply, <laughs> indicating she she no, or maybe she didn't care. Yeah, he's like, "Yeah, yeah. if he died, yeah. so be it." Um, she is going by the name Blake, which is her dad's last name. The comedian, of course, they have a very volatile relationship, uh, and it's interesting that I think her, the fact that she we see her, you know, shoot the shadow. We see her later shoot this uh, um, Seventh Cavalry guy. Mm. She's got. She's a pretty no nonsense. She is, you know. And so she, I think she's taken some of that um, lethal vigilantism from her dad. Perhaps I liked one of the references she makes to her father. 
uh, when she was talking to uh, Sister Knight um, about uh, why she looked into the closet because uh, she looked into her father's closet <laughs> after he died. <laughs> right, right. Uh, we do get the idea that uh, Lori... He had a secret closet. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. now she just looks. Now she just <laughs> Right, all the time. That, yeah, there it is. <laughs> and she even, yeah, she says, uh, you know, a lot of people who think they're good guys are guys who end up getting strung up and have secret closets. <laughs> She's obviously uh, very intelligent. She deduces that uh, Sister Knight is the one who was found the secret closet uh, and stole something from the model that was in the secret closet. Right. Uh, whether Lori Blake knows that it's a clan outfit, I'm not sure. No, point. she doesn't know. She doesn't say she knows anyway. I mean. Yeah, I mean, how could she? Maybe know? she. So, I mean, what would she think it would be? She thinks it's maybe like a, like Don Johnson was a uh, costumed hero, perhaps, or you know. Yeah, she doesn't know. Okay. I don't think so. I don't think she has a. I mean, you know, she doesn't have to be godlike. She right. She's have to know godlike. Everything. But yeah, I guess there was a there was a, um, uh, a bust or whatever that was sitting on. Yeah. Hence, it wasn't just floating in space. It was just like it's just floating in space. Okay, that makes more sense. Space junk. Uh, <laughs> space junk. Uh, so that is the introduction to Lori. There's a lot more to tell on the Lori story, but um, there is. Let's. Uh, the other stories we hear about um, are we learn a lot more about Ozymandias. We do, and his plight. They actually name him, which right. um, is is an irritation of mine. In, in that there's been this reluctance uh, to say that that's who he is. Right. We were it's listening to like the podcast that they've got with the HBO podcast. Now they were talking to Damon Lindelof, and that issue came up of like. Everybody knew who he was all this time, <laughs> and he kind of didn't really have a great answer for it. He was just like, yeah, yeah we know. We're, we don't want people to think, oh, it's just a sequel, yeah. but it is a sequel. Yeah, and he doesn't, even, he doesn't like sequel. the se word sequel, but even like, though technically, yes, it's a sequel. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, just lean into it. Yeah, man. No. yeah well, it may be in part because Alan Moore, the uh, creator, the writer, along with Dave Gibbons, um, who is not happy that this show or the movie, he's not anything, nothing. I My work speaks for itself. Ah, okay. So, don't uh, touch it, don't touch it. I think that's part of his reluctance to say, this is a sequel. Well, <laughs> well I will say that even David Lindelof in the uh, interview was like, yeah, it, we, we get it, it wasn't a surprise. It yeah. wasn't like, what? Yeah. It was like, a, uh, okay, fine. <laughs> um, but yes, Jeremy Irons is Ozymandias. Yes. Ben so puts on the that's uh, I like that moment when he puts on the, he puts on the suit. Yeah, even though it's sort of like duh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, well, quick onto his backstory. We uh, it is now apparent. And then we can get into your theory. Yeah, it is apparent that he, I feel that he is uh, he is in captivity at the moment. He is trapped. Where he is trapped is a mystery, but it is I would say off world. I think uh, Dr. Manhattan has trapped him either, you know, the fact that they're dealing with that little glass case over the little uh, terrarium, maybe it's kind of like a terrarium that he's placed um, uh, Ozymandias in. It's like his own little, it's, hey look, it's a fun little world for you. I'm not <laughs> saying it's hell per se, although <laughs> we, we hear that joke yeah, where it's like Ozymandias gets sent to hell. Yeah. This is his hell, mm. and then, um, but uh, uh, you know, there's certain rules to this place. When when Ozymandias tries to go and shoot a buffalo to get better hides, to get basically protect his astronauts better, he gets warned off. There's some masked mm. person mm -hmm. shoots at his feet and it's like, next time there won't be a shot at your feet. Yeah. Um, so the game warden, I assume this is Dr. Manhattan, uh, is... Uh, wow. Uh, Basically, keeping him at bay. Oh, who do you? Think I guess he can make. I guess he can make copies of himself. So that yeah. could be uh, the person who's the sort of jailer. Um, I think he's also created like now. That I, I don't think these clones, if you want to call them that, whatever they are, are actually Ozymandias' creations. I think they were put there to serve him in this prison mm. that he's in. Okay, and he's dealing with what he's got. Okay. Also, notice I thought this in the. Um, he's had this birthday cake three times now. Yes. Each time it's got one more candle in it. 
Each it's basically a, each episode is like episode one, one candle. Episode two, mm. two candles. Episode three, three candles. Interesting. And just be interesting if they keep that motif yeah. going. And then the episode eight, eight candles. Oh. Um, but yeah, so he's attempting to put one of his clones into space, into or into some kind of an outer atmosphere thing. So he he's trying to use what he's got at hand. He's uh, he's been given a suit of armor as a decoration in his in his prison essentially so he uses that he takes the top of the terrarium uses that for the glass case on the front he's retrofitting basically an attempt at escape uh obviously in this case it doesn't work because we see that the guy is frozen so something he went into some kind of a you know stratosphere situation and froze to death is, mm. is my, the implication um so my guess is all these attempts he's you know this letter warning him not to attempt to escape is not going to stop him. Ozymandias is eventually going to figure out how to escape this place. I think so. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, probably otherwise, not next episode, otherwise, but then uh, it would have nothing to do with the show because yeah. he, you know, no one has communicated with him. None of his communications have been with anybody who's, you know, it's all these people that haven't really right, right. He's yet, off on so. his own, and then everybody else is doing his other stuff. He somehow has to come back into the story yeah. as it is, which is why I think, especially because he's fixated on the little the origin story for Doctor Manhattan. I feel like Doctor Manhattan is the is his jailer. I think that's where that mm. kind of connects in. I'm not sure how that all fits with his escape per se, right, but right. Um, that's 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 the notion I'm getting. Mm. Um, which also then now that we've got. Lori Blake show up, who is a former love interest yes. of Dr. Manhattan, yes. Yes. who is on the phone kind of talking to Dr. Manhattan. Yes. We're, we're seeing these heroes start to, like, I could see the connections mm. eventually perhaps coming to play hmm. uh, by the end of the season. Something has happened. It's, you know, it's all supposed to conclude by the end of the yeah. season. So The other thing was the, we saw that the, there was a name drop at the Russians are trying to do re recreate the process that created Dr. Manhattan. There's like, I forgot what it's called now, an intrinsic intrinsic radiation oh, device. Oh, I think I missed something that. Like when that. did that happen? They just name drop it somewhere in the middle of the episode like, "Oh, the you know the Russians are blah 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 blah." Oh, okay. <laughs> We're going to have Dr. Moscow or something coming out. Um, so that that's going to go somewhere. I me thinks maybe that's <laughs> Maybe that's an Ozymandias thing where he'll eventually then go and try to recreate those powers and then he'll be, look, ah, the Russians helped me. All right, anyway, um, that's that's kind of the Ozymandias side of things. I will say we do see another little name drop. This is for later, I think, maybe even next episode, is this Millennium Clock. Mm. As Lori Blake's flying in, uh, it's noted, oh, look, there's a Millennium Clock. And... The person who's running it, uh, the true organization, we see that name a few times, uh, she apparently bought out the, whatever, Ozymandias' uh, Vites organization after he just died. <laughs> um, so she's taken over. And her, when she christened this thing, she did the poem from Ozymandias, like, look upon my works in despair. Mm. So it's obvious, maybe she still has some connection to Ozymandias or, you know, whatever. Mm. Um, I think I think we might see that that's the case in some way. Mm. All right, right, right. Those are all drops for later. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in the present, we've got um, Agent Dale Petey. He's a young FBI agent who has a PhD in history. Lori picks him to go with her to Tulsa. Interestingly, it's Dale Petey's uh, mythical wiki page, PDpedia, is where you can find all of the HBO extras. We'll talk about a little bit of some of those extras in a second because I, I went ahead and read through them. Uh, a couple of interesting little tidbits there. But in any case, that's kind of the, their their way into this page is this guy who's kind of fascinated with masked heroes and their history. In fact, he even brings a mask with him. Like, we could be, we could wear the masks. Yes, yes, like, yes, uh, yes, yes. What are you, the Lone Ranger? <laughs> we'll back to yeah. that One of the things we learned is something we asked about in the previous episode, which is like, is this happening all nationwide? Right. And it's not. It is not. But potentially it could. Because uh, a number they've heard from a number of uh, different states or whatever, like, oh, what can oh, we learn about what you did? Yeah, oh, crimes see. down, blah, 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 blah. Or whatever it's doing, yeah. 
or maybe what they're discovering is different uh, Rorschach groups um, throughout the nation are, are attacking cops so they feel like this is what we can do. Gotcha. So what we see is that um, there was the Keene Act in 1977 that uh, basically outlawed masked vigilantes. Um, I'm guessing that's probably what led to Night Owl being put in jail. Um, somehow, Lori Blake managed to either maybe she just put up the like, okay, fine, I'll be an FBI agent instead of a masked hero. But somehow she skirted that little issue. Yeah, maybe she'd already stopped. Yeah. Um, and then we see now that Keen's son uh, is the one, he's a, a senator from Oklahoma, he's the one that has initiated this new act, new ish act. Uh, that is a, like an amendment to the Keene Act, to his dad's act, which is, hey, it's acceptable in this case because uh, cops are, were under attack, and so um, it's okay in this situation for them to hide their faces. Um, uh, yeah, there's a big, you know, we see again the cops with their masks on are like abusing people's rights. Yeah. They're, they're, they're certainly not just the like lawful good guys in this. No, like the cops are the cops have their own issues, and so there's I think there's this give and take between protecting yourself. Oh, I I need protection, you know, from retribution, uh, but then also like putting the mask on makes you like not accountable. Right. Um, and in fact, one of those little extra materials mentions that the reason that Judd Don Johnson's character doesn't wear a mask is because under the law, the leader of the Tulsa cops has to be accountable, has to keep their face. Yeah, but to give you, um, certainly beyond um, Lori's perspective on the issue, where she says, like, how do you tell uh, a masked vigilante from a masked cop or whatever, and like, and she's, uh, Sister Knight says, I don't know, or at least, um, and she said, neither do I. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I think that's what they're no trying difference. to, yeah. But these cops are now vigilantes. Because they aren't accountable, right. you know, they can pull a whole bunch of people into a warehouse and beat the crap out of them and uh, abuse their rights. Um, she doesn't seem. She says she doesn't care. I feel like she kind of does care. She being Lori. That could be. I mean, She's yeah, got this I front see. of like, oh, yes, I don't care, right, but, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's uh, an interesting thing I think about her, where we see a number of different facets of her from listening to the podcast about. Um, Someone, something that uh, the narrator or the, the the host of it suggested that I didn't have an impression of, which is uh, Looking Glass, um, that he's somehow pure or something, which I didn't I have that impression of him necessarily. Right, I think a lot of people are, have maybe pegged him as perhaps a turncoat or something. Um, I haven't, but I, I haven't. One of the reasons I haven't is because it's almost a little too obvious because he seems a little... <laughs> <laughs> a little shady, but right. I don't see him as like, oh, I'm the yeah, I'm the purest of the heroes. Yeah, I, I don't that see was, that. That was an odd uh, uh, thing takeaway. Yeah, um, but I, I certainly appreciated his. I mean, I liked his, the scene he had with uh, Lori, where it was, you know, she was basically asking questions. So like, okay, I'm gonna have to tell you things that I right. She not, knows his but, name. She knows yep, his last name. Yep. She knows Sister Knight's name. Yep. Uh, all, it's just like just drop it cause. yeah but he was he's showing how smart he is in that she was like asking him about uh, oh so this information came out and he's like I was not present when that occurred when she got the right, information the right legally. I was he yes was on the other side of a door yeah <laughs> I yeah, did not like, do your, any <laughs> the pod is your racist detector yes she was like, yeah. no it's not that it's not some, but, simplistic fine <laughs> um <laughs> Interesting that she also uses his face as a mirror. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think she's, Johnson did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I think she was mocking. She was mocking him. Yeah, and, you but, know. Uh, anyway, just kind of interesting. Like people keep using his face for <laughs> their own mirrors. She tries to also intimidate Sister Knight. She, she, I think, successfully intimidates Looking Glass. Yeah, like, giving her the information she wants. Yes. Um, she's less successful at that with Sister Knight. Yes, I would say. Yes. Um, but, okay, so a lot of this takes place around the funeral for Judd. Yes. Sheriff Judd Crawford. Uh, it was interesting. I found it interesting that she pretended not to know that was... She knows everything, she being Lori. Uh, 
And she's like, oh, this happened and this happened. And I was at the crime scene and I saw this uh, wheelchair. And then somebody's like, oh, yeah, well, we're going to the uh, funeral today. Oh. Oh, there's a funeral today? I was kind of like, oh. I thought she was being a little sarcastic. I don't know. It was just a little. I, uh, well, she did make reference to the fact that it was happening very fast and that they oh, were going to have to point. exhume the body. She wanted so that was perhaps, maybe she knew that, but I think she was trying to say, this is weird that this yeah, is happening. Because she is not, she, I think in her mind she wants to see whether he was killed first yeah. and then hanged. Yeah. So they're like, oh, he was killed by hanging. It's like, well, was he? Did, or anything else, was poisoned. or Maybe anything else, shot. yeah, Maybe. anything else they could have, they could establish. I mean, yeah. I think one of the things um, uh, where a reason why Looking Glass may have been like mm, is because he, we know he was under the influence of drugs, and so perhaps to protect his reputation, not to say you know, oh, he had cocaine in him or whatever. Um, but uh, she is, you know, she just wants any information. Uh, presumably that you could get because who knows what that where right, it could right. lead. So, right. So, um, the, good point. And, and two, she was also, um, at least in part anyway, questioning whether or not it really was the 7th Cavalry that was behind it. So, Correct. She, because she's, in fact, he even mentions, oh, I don't know if he mentions it. I think he does. I think it's Looking Glass that says, oh, they usually claim credit. Yes. But they didn't in this case. Somebody says that anyway. Oh, yeah. No, uh, it may have been her who said that. Which is a, that is a big factor, right? Yeah the, yeah. the fact that the 7th Cavalry hasn't claimed this killing is a big like, yes. beacon. Um, so, uh, the funeral happens. Uh, there's an, kind of an awkward moment when Sister Knight is forced to sing Get Along Little Doggy. Mm. I don't know. There's this Forced? <laughs> well, I mean, she's like, oh... Forced, I, I forced talked, by her front prior promise. Right. I like, oh, uh, Judd and I had an agreement. If anything bad happened to the other one, we would read out what you know our wishes at our each other's funeral. So he wanted me to sing Get Along Little Doggy. <laughs> and not just like a verse. She has to sing Yeah, the whole thing. Get along, little doggy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get along, little doggy. Yeah. Anyway, but he <laughs> I just uh, I felt sorry for her in that moment. Like, <laughs> oh man! I thought it was a moving moment. Okay, I mean, everybody no. was clapping along. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so meanwhile, there is. I was like, she's not doing a bad job. <laughs> <laughs> I just think like he wanted me to sing "Get Along, Little Doggy." I have a tape recorder here, and uh, we're gonna hear "Get Along, Little Doggy." <laughs> All right. Anyway. Um, I know now you are not the person. <laughs> Asking to carry out. If you ever want me to sing "Get Along, Little Doggy" at your funeral, my oh, is that uh, that's one song? Is that <laughs> the other playlist is gonna be all right. I don't know. I suppose there's a song out there. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I know a lot of Depeche Mode songs. <laughs> I'll do a Devo song. There we go. Crack that whip. Yeah. If you die, I'll, uh, all I'll right. crack that whip. In all your right, funeral, sounds good. Um, um, I karaoke that one, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, so. Meanwhile, Seventh Cavalry comes in through a mausoleum. Uh, come out, the guy comes out. He's got a bomb strapped to him. Yes, and he says, "Hey, if you shoot me, it's attached to my heart, and my heart stops. This place is going to blow. I want the race trader, uh, uh, Senator Keene. Senator Keene's like, huh? Here, just take me." <laughs> He walks over. <laughs> He's very quick to just agree to this guy's terms, and everybody's quick to let him go, which is kind of like. I mean, I think cops. you're right to be suspicious. Yeah. Um, but I think you're a little. Keen is a villain. You're... He's horrible. <laughs> I don't know why the mustache isn't there, but when it comes, he's going to be twirling it anyway. I think you're a little uh, dismissive of his actions okay. in that moment. He was very. Fast to be like, oh right, this makes sense. Here, take me as hostage. Well, I, mm. it, you know, if someone is he truly a danger, you know, I mean, perhaps it's it's uh, the trope is perhaps oh shoot, how can I avoid this? And you didn't do that. Um, but for someone who really does care about other people, you would think he wouldn't take too long. So in a in a <laughs> dystopian, very bitter look at humanity <laughs> show. He can either be incredibly angelic and awesome, yeah. <laughs> or this could have all been a plan to help him get elected as president. Mm. That's the option I'm going for. Well, it could be. Okay. Yes, I don't know. Um, this is a photo op for him, and a look. I'm, 
I mean, the fact that uh, 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 Judd's wife um, was involved in his campaign, right. and there are clearly and his some dad ties. was way into the political stuff ahead of time. Like he's connected, right? And uh, that there was um, apparently some connection between uh Judd and you know the clan it all might be uh suggestive of uh perhaps a connection between um Keen and the Rorschach group the uh, 7th cavalry uh it, you know it may be that you know um i'm certainly you know but yeah we'll see uh the background materials from that pdpedia site include in this week's episode, a letter written in 1955 from uh, Keene's dad, so the one who did the Keene Act. So it's in 1955. He's writing to a Sheriff Crawford. Now, at that point, 1955, Don Johnson's Judd Crawford was only six years old, so he's not writing to that guy. He's writing, I believe, to Judd Crawford's grandfather, who spent 55 years in the Sheriff's Department in Tulsa. So Grandfather Crawford is getting a letter from Keen, and the letter is basically saying, hey, last night when you became head of this order in place of me, uh, you know, uh, as a gift of that, to memorialize this occasion, I'm giving you this painting, Martial Feats of Comanche Horsemanship. Uh, as a reminder that in order to beat your enemy, you've got to be cunning and skillful. Um, and this isn't, you're not getting this. This is a gift. This is something that you keep as long as you're head of this order. And when you pass it on to the order to someone else, you must pass this painting on as also a reminder. Um, so what I get out of that is, you know, it's, it doesn't say clan anywhere. Uh, but it suggests that Keen who, you know, ironically was like, no masked vigilantes, uh, was a masked vigilante, a Klansman, uh, and he was in fact the head of the Klan, and maybe in this area or whatever, and he was passing on the mantle of leadership to Don Johnson's grandfather. So Sheriff Crawford at that time was, uh, you know, head of the Klan. And it's interesting that the painting is still in Judd Crawford's possession. Yes. Because theoretically, it was supposed to be passed on to the next leader of the clan, which to me indicates he might have been the next leader of the clan. Mm -hmm. That his grandfather mm -hmm. was like, yeah, I'm supposed to pass this painting along. Here's the painting. Mm -hmm. And keep your suit in your secret closet. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's... Uh, kind of what I got out of that. Sure. Uh, if you out there have uh, seen that and have a different interpretation, uh, feel free to uh, put it in the comments. Yes, yes. That leads to, yeah, that moment when Lori Blake is confronting Sister Knight about stealing <clears throat> something out of the closet. Yes. And Sister Knight's kind of like, ooh, I'm scared of you. you She's yeah, like, I eat, eat good guys for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That line sounded a little weird. I don't know. It's just kind of like, okay. You're try it sounds like someone trying to sound tough. Well, that's, I think, what she was trying to say. I mean, you know. But without actually being tough. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> oh. Uh, right. Well, oh, okay. you know, one thing she did, though, is she was, is, is throughout the whole conversation <clears throat> is laying out the things that don't add up in what they've all claimed. So I mean, she, uh, she obviously knows, I mean, well, we know for a fact, she knows that Sister Knight is... Angela. So she knows she's a mass vigilante. Yeah, but one thing she talks about is uh, the tires for the uh, yeah. at the crime scene yeah. that were for a wheelchair. wheelchair. So what's that about? And uh, they're the, I'm forgetting some of the other things. But she brings all uh, up to say that there's something weird going. Oh, that that you know she went to that place to do that. She doesn't think she's the type of person to faint. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you went through that area to you get something. You pretended to faint in order yes, to, yes, and then yes. this thing is missing. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so she's basically saying, I'm going to oh, get Oh, and you. then it was like, you know, we wanted to, you know, you say that, um, uh, or at least everybody assumes that it's the uh, Seventh Cavalry who's behind this crime. And so, you know, they haven't claimed, that's when they say, they haven't claimed, uh, you know, they typically Credit, do. Yeah. So what's going on with that? So, you know, and we would have exhumed the body, but he was blown up. And what 
the nice, the cool undercurrent to that is that Sister Knight is basically what Silk Spectre was doing back in the day, right? I mean, in a way, right? I mean, she, of all people, Lori Blake would understand the idea of someone who dresses up as a vigilante goes and, uh, you know, tries to help the cops. Oh. Um, and she doesn't do that anymore. Right. But you would think there, there's like a, she mm. seems pretty dismissive of like the current crop of masked vigilantes. Yes. Maybe it's kind of like a back in my day, you know, we had an actual blue god. You guys, I don't know. I know. It's just, it's well, weird. I mean, it, you she know. She doesn't seem to have any uh, empathy for this group that's doing exactly what she did. But she at one point thought, hey, this is a good idea. And she seems to like not really take that into it. Like, well, yeah. It's, you know, I, yeah, I think that's what they're, we're coming to, is her being able to express that. I mean, she says, you know, a couple of times uh, there that, uh, you know, I mean, she's part of the anti-vigilante group. Yeah. You know, exactly. so the fact that um, these cops have become vigilantes, you know, is not going to be like, oh, good. You know, she when she's there, she's casting aspersions. She's saying, doubt, doubting the whole thing. So, you know, the fact that she used to do it doesn't mean, you know, that she doesn't. Uh, she's a complicated person. We do so, also see, uh, I think she had arrested. I think, you know, it's like you'd think, at, you know, when when she way back at the start of the episode when she uh, <laughs> staged that crime yeah. in order to expose There's that hero. Somebody's like, "Oh, he's a hero!" Blah blah. And she's just, you know, yeah. she does not having any of it at all. You know. Yeah, yeah. No, it's. Itch- I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's a f- fault in the show or something. It's a. No, but it's you're, interesting that you're, she's got right. this. Yes. Weird thing of like, eh, I could be empathetic in this moment. I mean, because, you know, yes, he's taking on her father's name or whatever, but he's, you know, his reputation sh- is, is terrible, you know, yeah. as a result of uh, what came out a, after. He was like a sadomasochist. Yeah. Basically. You know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, oh, we do also see that she, another uh, hero or vigilante that she took down was the Revenger. Yes. Name, yes. Which yes. Yes. I pretty, I'm pretty sure that was in Thor Ragnarok, isn't it? Is it where where Thor's trying to come up with a name? Oh, he's like, the, the oh, what do you call yourself? We're Revengers. called uh, we're mm. called the Revengers. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so that might be yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a little Marvel reference there, perhaps. Maybe, but, but I suspect that that's a character they've talked yeah. about before. Yeah. All right. So the Revenger in the Shadow, unfortunately. Yeah, they're done. They're. There. Or at least they're retired for now. <laughs> uh, so the rest, uh, I think the rest of stuff to talk about perhaps is this conversation she has with uh, the phone talking to uh, Dr. Manhattan. Um, uh, so they have this big giant blue phone booth because, you know, the Internet's not really a thing here, so they don't really have whatever. Technology's a little, a little wacky. But she goes in, she dials a whole bunch of numbers, and she gets to talk into a message machine for a certain amount of time, which theoretically Dr. Manhattan is, would then listen to. Right. Um, she spends the time telling a joke. Yes. Two jokes. Uh, but the first joke is about this uh, bricklayer who had a daughter. We assume that's a reference to the comedian and her. And they were going to build a barbecue. And they built it, and it was perfect, but there was a brick missing, uh, or an extra brick left over. Uh, so the bricklayer was going all crazy about, oh, you got to break this up and do it again. And she's like, no, 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 no. And then she threw it up into the air. That's the, the solution that the, the young girl, yeah. had, that she was like, what if we threw the... Um, and then she's like, oh, wait, I've told the joke wrong. Yeah. And then she goes into the other joke, which... Uh, which the punchline of that joke involves the first joke. So it, it was all one joke. In yes. Way. So the second joke... Uh, involves uh, three heroes who turn out to be Night Owl, Ozymandias, and Dr. Manhattan. Three people going to heaven. Uh, right, at, at uh, St. Peter, at the right. gates. Yes. And they're asking to be led into heaven. Well, God really loves what That's he true, says. That's true, it is God. It's not St. It's not Peter. No. Good, good point. Yeah. He's, a, he's a different mass hero. Yes. Um, so God asks them, like, oh, what did you do in your life? Um, Night Owl, did all this truth and judge I created I'm good at inventing um, oh did you kill anybody no of course not well you're too soft go to hell yep and Ozymandias uh, very smart oh crafty oh did you kill anybody yeah oh, I killed yeah, millions no, no, no. Uh, well you, you're a monster you're a monster go to hell then Dr. Manhattan 
the blue god comes in and uh, uh, basically you're basically a god too like me you know is what uh, and uh, did you I guess he asked did you kill anybody and he's like well I yeah I like he wouldn't know the difference between killing them and not killing them because they had the same particles so this is between life and death are the same so I forgot the reason he got sent to hell but is it just like oh you're disconnected from humanity I so think so you you're mm. not human anyway mm. I thought maybe he was going to split the channels and, or turn the tables and be like, I am God. And then like he turned, puts God in hell. But he didn't do it. No. Lori Blake does it. We yeah, for some reason she doesn't recognize uh, this person that is the last part of the joke. This girl who is behind everybody Which doesn't we recognize assume is Lori Blake. I, right. I would put yeah, the metaphor being. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but uh, then that the brick comes from heaven and destroy uh, right, kills him. <laughs> yeah. So the the brick that sh that the girl falls threw up, up in the first joke falls on God's head at the end and uh, puts his brain out through his nose. And I just like, like the idea that she just like was, oh, and of course when God right. dies he goes to hell. Right. <laughs> like, does he? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting. Thing is, you know, but yeah, I mean, the stories don't talk about what happens to God yeah. when he dies. It doesn't, you know. So, um, so she uh, was kind of an underrated, uh, overlooked person in this in this joke, and uh, was crafty enough to to kill God and send God to hell. Um, she then finishes the joke by saying, "Well, you're probably not going to listen to any of this anyway." So, you know, good night. And we hear like, oh, the upload will reach Mars in 40 seconds. She closes the phone. She starts to walk out. About 40 seconds later, uh, it's Angela, uh, Sister Knight's car, <laughs> which disappeared and was taken up by a big magnet. Yes. Probably 24 hours earlier, maybe yeah, more. Maybe. Um, comes crashing down to Earth. Yes. Um, and she takes that as a sign that. Uh, Dr. Manhattan was listening. Does she? I think she does because she looks up and sees Mars. Well, I think. Well, okay, it, it, I guess it's that's not, possible. Okay. Um, Here's what I got out of it. I got that that she, in her mind, Dr. Manhattan heard the joke and then dropped a brick from space, essentially. Like, hey. Oh, okay. Um, and that she's like, oh, he is listening to me. Oh. But. Okay. Okay, but what is what's your interpretation? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 either A, she's, uh, my interpretation is, I don't know if she connected the two necessarily, except to say, isn't it funny that it happened after I did this? Um, so I don't know that she necessarily thinks that Dr. Manhattan sent it down. If she did, she's wrong, okay. because, you know, it's, <laughs> it's like, I, we don't have the, the, the opinion or the theory that uh, Dr. Manhattan's involved in taking... Right, why would he use a magnet? Right. Yeah. So I mean, it's if she has some wrong theory at that moment, then that's a weird sort of thing to sort of you know. I think she, either that, either a that's one of the things she's aware of is the fact that this car has been missing, and so that's funny to her now because now she knows a little bit more about what's going on. And, okay. And I I did something. not see that at all. I got that as she she was connecting it to the call. I mean, but she had just said you're not listening to this anyway. They right. they deliberately did this forty second thing. Which I thought was like a, hey. In other words, when we when he reacts, it's going to be a little while later. So she gets the forty seconds away, and then a car falls, and then she looks up into space, which she would obviously right. anyway. But where did yeah. they come from? But right. And there's like a little. It looks like there's like a lens flare or something that kind of looks like red, like yeah. Mars. Um, I think that's what I got out of it. Is she's like, you're oh, you did hear my call. Okay. okay. I don't think so. You don't but think so. you know, I mean, but you're not saying that that's Doctor Manhattan actually did it. You're I don't saying that's what I she. I don't think so. Yeah, I think she's just struck by the. Uh, I mean, the coincidence. Of yeah, it. that's all. That's what I'm thinking about. That's the simplest answer. Okay. You know, if she came up with the wrong theory, then you know, that's a kind of a weird thing to have happen because, you know. It's not. By the way, Dr. we do Manhattan. see it, and really, if you think about it, it's like okay, you're, the, you're not supposed to get their message until later, so you shouldn't be able to act on it instantaneously. Well, he's Dr. Manhattan, right? I mean, it's just like in her mind, she, he, <laughs> he's like, you know, God powers. No, All right. 
Um, all right, well, what did you guys get out of that scene? <laughs> did, do you think she interpreted that as Dr. Manhattan's listening? Or did she just interpret it as, ah... It's it's Sister Knight's car. It's back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of the things is like, oh, isn't it funny that this car dropped out of nowhere? You know, maybe right after my story about a brick falling from the sky. Yeah, there you go. Boom, uh, uh, boom. boom. There you go. Comedy, comedy, goals. comedy, folks. Um, I'm sure Sister Knight's gonna be really glad to get that car back in yes. the, sh in the, in the, the shape, shape that, that it's in. in. <laughs> Here's your pancake. Enjoy. Yeah. Well, you know it's. Probably she's got still enough money from Red for Asians, you know. Ah, to... ah, good point. Well, by the way, we do see in those extra materials, I think they've said it on the show as well, that Robert Redford is, in fact, retiring. So his 30 years as president, he's now he's not going to run again. Right. Uh, hence the reason that people are like, oh, wait, we can now fill the vacuum and go and start a new legacy. Right. Essentially. Um the Millennium Clock, there was a, it looked like there were some flying vehicles with like, they were carrying items. It looked similar to the magnet picking up uh, Sister Knight's car. So I'm wondering if the people that rescued uh, Will uh, are connected to the true organization. He does say, I got friends in high places. Millennium Clock's up pretty high. He was also, you know, anyway. Sure. Anyway, we'll see. We'll see if the tech yes. uh, corresponds there. Um, but that's yeah. that's kind of about yeah, it for I now. Think so, yeah. There's a lot going on. Yes. Many many uh, many themes in play. Yes. Uh, so uh, so yeah. So come on back. We'll be talking uh, Mr. Robot and obviously Watchmen uh, in the days to come. So yes. thanks so much. Bye.